Hey, welcome to episode 30 of Starbase Flyover Update. Climb on board as we cover the last week's developments of Starbase from 28th of January through to this week's flyover on the 1st of February. We'll see ongoing work at Massey's, a raptor on the loose at Sanchez, continued Star Factory expansion at the build site, and a concrete roof for the new building at the launch site. My name is Jeff A, and we are set to join RGV Aerial Photography for a flyover to enjoy the views of Starbase Texas. Thanks to Procky for creating these labelled maps for all four sites with Starbase. The current work at Massey's testing facility has not slowed down, so let's have a look around. Here's what Massey's looked like in our previous flyover on January 28th. All areas are moving forward in this week's flyover on the 1st. Let's start at the top right hand corner of the site where we can see progress is still continuing on the slurry wall for the in-progress flame trench. This week we finally caught sight of the clamshell digger in action. Moving to the new set of foundations that were spotted on the last flyover, we can see that conduit placement has begun. Shifting focus to the new methane tank farm, we can see the tank from the suborbital tank farm has been installed. Plumbing in the methane tanks is progressing, and more pipe work installed since last week as well as pipe stands. The nitrogen exhaust side of the subcoolers differs from what we are used to seeing at the orbital tank farm, with the inclusion of the square device. Now to the steel structure spotted last week we can see that no visual progress has been made on this mysterious structure. Taking a quick look at the tank farm portion of the site, we can see more concrete has been poured to further decrease the dirt areas of the site, which will minimise mud and dust. Moving to the test article site, we can see that concrete has been poured in the area where drilling and excavation work has taken place for an unknown structure. This layer of concrete is so workers can create a pile cap. These steel embeds being manufactured further up may end up as part of the cap, leading to speculation of it being a future test stand. A direction borer was spotted last week, and we can see the results of that work down by the entrance here where what looks like two water pipes have appeared. And with that, on to Sanchez. Here's a labelled map of this site for those unfamiliar with the layout. Hit pause if you want a better look. Now that you're familiar with Sanchez, let's compare this photo from the flyover on the 28th of January with the aerial shot captured in this week's flyover on the 1st. As you might guess, things are also moving along quickly here, so let's have a look around. To begin with, you will notice that the mobile crane known as Grover is attached to a corner segment of the new tower. This was after the segment was raised and placed on a jig, and then removed suggesting issues were noticed during its placement. This is the second time this piece has been placed without success. Large site drainage work is progressing well, with more pipes being submerged in the trenches as well as concrete being poured nearby. Taking a quick look at the in-progress booster transport stand, we see no visual work has occurred since last week. A mysterious ring structure with clamps sits beside. Shifting to the right slightly, we can see the ship engine installation stand ring has had no visible progress in the last week. An engine installation platform sits beside after having some panels removed since the last flyover. We can see construction of yet another mystery item taking place further to the right. Moving to the containment structure spotted last week, we can see the two brown tanks have been installed within the structure, clarifying the theory that it's for spill containment. We believe these tanks have been repurposed for diesel fuel for the generators nearby. As we get closer to the rocket garden, let's take a look at the water tank. We can see a second one has started to take shape in the concrete pad next to the existing tank. To the right, formwork, rebar and plumbing work has continued on a new building. The intended use of this is currently unknown, one popular idea is for housing a couple of fire trucks for the town of Starbase, Texas. Moving to the Rocket Garden, a lot of activity has taken place in the area within the past week. An engine shuffle has taken place with three engines being removed from Ship 28. It's not known whether they found issues with them, or if this was planned beforehand. It's worth mentioning that there has been some speculation that this is the result of S25's mishap investigation, prompting SpaceX to make changes in the engine bay of the next flight article. S28. Regardless of the reason, at least one Raptor vacuum engine was reinstalled on S28 as of the writing of the script on the 4th, as seen by this lab padre footage compiled by Vix. Let us know what you make of this in the comments below. We can see two SPMTs have been placed under the booster stand and so far only moved slightly forward and then back. With work continuing on the OLM, it's unclear why the stand is getting ready for transporting a booster. Downcomer sections previously spotted outside the inventory tent have been moved, most likely into the tent for further assembly. Now let's hop over to the build site. Now entering the build site, where four boosters are stacked in the mega bay, Star Factory expansion keeps chugging along, and now we have some possible indications of window placement. 
Here's Procky's map of the various bays and factories as we make our way around this site. Let's quickly look at the comparison from the flyover on February 28th to this on January 1st. Starting out with Mega Bay 2 as usual, it seems like workers have not yet placed the ship engine installation ring atop the six vertical legs, as it awaits the placement of the centre platform. Meanwhile, a new side building has been added to the right side of Mega Bay 2. We're still not sure of its purpose, as it doesn't seem tall enough to house Raptor vacuum engines. Shifting to this side, we see that crews are busy covering up the roof with panels, leaving only the small opening we saw last week for the crane to lift out equipment remaining on the top level of Mega Bay 2. Now shifting left to take a peek into Mega Bay 1, we see Booster 12 front and centre, atop the engine installation stand partially obscured by the roll-down door. To get a better look inside the booster bay, let's take a look at these ground angles posted by SpaceX on February 2nd, showing the three boosters, Booster 10, 12 and 11 from left to right, each sitting on an engine installation stand. There are many fine details in these images not seen before of various workstations and the new door. These three boosters are at various stages of engine and shielding installation and were flanked by the two halves of Booster 13, but not for long. On February 2nd, B-13's methane tank was stacked atop its lock section, topping out the booster. It's worth mentioning that Booster 13 is the last booster made using rings not from the Star Factory, but from the ring yard. If all goes well, we should see B-13 fly on Flight 6 with Ship 31. Shout out to Lab Padre for this video clip and Vix for creating the time lapse. Speaking of S-31, we can see it here in front of the high bay, with S-30 hiding behind it. In this flyover we were able to catch a rare glimpse of the innards of the high bay, with the ship turntable and its clamps seen in full resolution. Some engine shielding is staged out the front here. We'll now move to the Star Factory. Credits to Carlos Nunez aka Starbase Surfer for capturing these three segments expanding south to the previous location of tents 1 and 2 and the mid bay. A large doorway can be seen cut out into the already constructed taller section of Star Factory. Taking to the air, we notice that roof beams and panels have already been connected from the newer section to the existing one. Peeking inside the Star Factory, we spot the white casings for these roof panels. Roof panels are also being installed on the section closest to Highway 4, which has smaller embeds, pointing to the lack of heavy bridge cranes in this section. Could this be for offices? Supporting this theory is a notable lack of horizontal beams in this thin strip of the façade, and this is therefore the location where windows are most likely to be installed. Panning up the image, most of the square footings dug at the former location of Tent 3 have been poured with concrete. In addition, footings have also been dug right next to the existing ones at Phase 1 of the Star Factory, showing the sheer scale of the future Star Factory in terms of square footage. Around the back of Star Factory, work on the drainage system for the roof guttering can be seen here, with a large culvert going in to connect all the downpipes. There's not much to mention around the village, except that the housing work is progressing. Before heading to the launch site, please consider supporting our channel on Patreon for access to full resolution flyover galleries and discussion the same day we fly. Here's a labelled map of the launch site for those unfamiliar. Ok, let's compare this photo from the flyover on the 28th with the aerial shot captured in this week's flyover on the 1st. Let's jump right in. With nothing new to see over at the suborbital side, we'll take a look at the LR11000 which is now back together after some much needed TLC. The configuration appears to be the same as before, with the standard boom and luffing jib combination. It shouldn't be much longer before the beast rises again as S28 will likely return to the launch site for another static fire campaign. Over at the new building under construction, we see formwork has been installed ahead of roof installation, which will also be concrete. Not much else would be expected to survive the harsh conditions so close to the launch mount. Based on the location of the supports on the left side of the structure, there will be a cantilevered roof making way for a possible break area out back. Moving to the orbital tank farm now, we see a good supply of pipework is waiting to be installed for the new tanks. If we take a close look between the gaps of the tanks at the rear, we can see multiple vaporizer stacks have been placed underneath. It's not known if this will be the permanent location for these, or if this is just temporary storage, but it's a safe location prior to IFT3 if that's the intent. Looking down from the trench that stretches the length of the methane storage lot, just in front of the pipe racks, a bundle of conduit has been placed inside to connect from one set of buried vaults to what could be more at the termination point of the trench near the newest comms hut. Lots of scaffolding still remains around the methane subcoolers as crews continue to work on wrapping the insulated piping for protection. With Flight 3 likely multiple weeks away still, crews have plenty of time to tidy things up. Sliding down to the lock side of the farm, we see more foundations have been prepared for the large pipe racks that will parallel those currently in place. Crews were in the process of cutting the concrete for prep of another slab at the time of the flyover. 
Over near the electrical bunker, an excavation has been made in a maze of conduit laid for whatever future structure equipment may be coming to this location. Looking closely, we see stubouts will sit above the future concrete slab in two different locations, and possibly a third. Before moving closer to the launch table, let's take a look at the tank shell support progress. With most of the welding work now complete, a matching coat of paint is being applied to make them more visually appealing. Work on the new concrete blast wall is also wrapping up. Not long after this flyover, formwork was put down for the slab that will anchor the wall in place. Concrete pouring commenced on Saturday, February 2nd. Once the slab is complete, additional concrete was added inside the wall sections at the joints to tie them all together. Moving on to the orbital launch pad now, we see the concrete work over near the berm is now finished. But I must ask, is concrete work at Starbase ever truly complete? On the OLM, fortification efforts for the shielding around the clamps and QDs continue. On the front of the BQD hood, new shielding can be seen at the bottom. In the centre of the OLM, we can see the alignment jig in place for the hold down clamps. Down at the tower base, where the new shielding has been installed, a welder can be seen working to firmly attach each plate to the rods connecting them to the concrete base. It's not pretty, but functional reform is certainly a theme we're accustomed to by now. We'll leave you today with this image of the new shielding for the corners at the base of the tower. These were the last pieces of the puzzle remaining to be seen prior to this flyover. And that's it for episode 30 of Starbase Flyover Update. Thank you for choosing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography and I hope you all enjoyed the flight. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on the new videos each week and leave a thumbs up. I'd like to give a special shout out to the current RGV team members, Vanta, Peekaboo, Lama Palooza, Stephanie B and Big Water UAV. Also to all the Patreon members that participate in the regular show and tell sessions for sharing their individual areas of expertise and last but not least, Irma for taking these great images. I'm Jeff A and we'll see you next week from 10,500 feet. That's all for now.